All right. Um, <clears throat> how many of you here uh, consider yourself Java programmers? Show of hands. Or Groovy, or Scala, or Clojure, or any of these others. How many of you have actually looked at JVM bytecode before? Okay. So those of you who have, great. Um, I want to uh, make sure that you understand that this is kind of a uh, introduction to bytecode. We're not going to be doing really wacky, crazy things like, you know, adding a new bytecode to the JVM or anything like that. This is going to be just going over the bytecode instruction set, uh, how it looks like, um, and specifically some of the tools involved in being able to examine them and, and play around with bytecode and, and all the other good stuff. Um, by the way, that's me, if anybody cares. How many of you care? Yeah, no hands go up, so we move on. So again, the goal here really is to just be able to understand the assembly language, if you will, of Java. Okay? One of the things that I learned relatively early in my career, and this is going back a ways, uh, you know, 25 years now. God, I'm old. 25 years or so, and back then I was doing C++. And one of the things that uh, one of the, the, the men I would consider my mentors, uh, one of the things he said is, you always want to understand what's going on one level below the level at which you're writing code. So if you're writing C++ on top of Windows, you want to understand x86 assembly code. You want to know what the compiler is turning everything into. If you're writing Java or Scala or Groovy or anything else that runs on top of the JVM, you want to understand one level below that. And in this particular case, this is known as the JVM bytecode instruction set. Uh, sometimes it's just referred to as bytecode. Sometimes it's called Java bytecode. The JVM spec doesn't really give it a nice formal name the way Microsoft called their intermediate language intermediate language or Microsoft intermediate language or common intermediate language, CIL. The thing that to note is that this was not the first time this had happened. As a matter of fact, the JVM bytecode set has kind of a long and rich history. There have been a number of virtual machines that have been around before Java. And as a matter of fact, there was one virtual machine that actually comes from uh, Smalltalk. And uh, this particular VM was always highly regarded for its incredible optimizations that it would make during runtime. And unfortunately, Smalltalk was not exactly an uber popular language back during the you know, 80s and then later 90s and whatnot. Fortunately, this virtual machine didn't actually disappear off the face of the earth. Another company purchased that particular virtual machine and asked, them to, asked the engineers at that ex-Smalltalk company to adjust the bytecode slightly so it would work as the next generation of their own virtual machine. And it came to be known as the hotspot. Java virtual machine. If you ever want to see the original Smalltalk sources that Hotspot came from, go Google on the web for a Smalltalk virtual machine called StrongTalk. It's out there, and if you've ever looked at any of the JDK source code, you'll notice that there is a significant amount of difference and overlap between the StrongTalk sources, which are open source, and the Hotspot uh, compiler code, JDK code, which is, of course is now open source under OpenJDK. This actually goes back even further than StrongTalk. One of the first virtual machines was known as the UCSD, the University of California San Diego P code machine. This was actually a Pascal compiler back in the days when Pascal was cool. I know it's hard to imagine days when Pascal was cool, but you know, it was about the same time that people were writing dinosaurs to work. So. Um, the P code compiler was actually what was known as a two stage compiler. So in the Java world, we compile our code into JVM bytecode. That's stage one. Ditto for the P code compiler. You would compile your Pascal code, it would turn it into an intermediate format. Then, however, the Pascal compiler required you to run a second stage compiler, which was tuned specifically to the machine you were running on. And so it would take the intermediate form and turn it into a native executable ahead of time. In the case of Java, of course, that all happens at runtime. And actually, technically, it happens twice. Once because Java starts interpreting the bytecode directly, 
and then a second time as it notices certain methods, certain blocks of code being executed over and over again, the hotspot nature of hotspot kicks in and transforms that into whatever happens to be optimized for the local machine. And this is part of the reason why Sun decided when they were working on Java to use this particular approach. Remember, it's not something we talk about much today, but this was, this was a big deal for Sun back in the early days of Java, back in you know, pre-1995 time. Originally, remember, Java was intended to be an embedded language to run on embedded devices. It's now kind of an apocryphal story, but originally James Gosling created this so that it would run on television set-top boxes. These are the cable boxes that you use to tune the various television channels and cables and so forth that you want to watch. And part of the reason for building an intermediate language like this, which could then be interpreted by different VMs running on different hardware, was because then Really, they only had to produce one compiler. They would just produce one VM per machine, and any advantages, any optimizations the compiler would take would be automatically felt across all the, the range of these different VMs. Well, needless to say, 25 years later, it's a good thing that Sun lost the contract to go work on that. Nothing like ghosts when they open the door. I think if I leave that open, it's going to screw up the lighting, so I'll close it. Hopefully the ghost is already inside and is seated right there. Don't piss him off. Um, fortunately, Sun lost the contract, and so Java you know, didn't end up getting embedded on this device, and Sun said, well, we've invested a fair amount of time in this engineering effort. What should we do? And Gosling said, well, there's this thing called the browser, I don't know, that might be big. Maybe we could go ahead and embed a JVM inside of the browser. And the various Sun executives kind of looked at each other and went, eh, 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 what else are we going to do with it? Okay, fine, sure, Jimmy, go off, do whatever you want to do. And thus, applets were born. Yay! Because applets are cool, right? Oh, I'm sorry, today we call them Silverlight. Because <laughs> that's all cool, too. Oh, I'm sorry, not Silverlight, I meant Flash. Because Flash is, anyway, moving on. The advantage of this, post all of this, you know, applet world, right, post, a, quite frankly, a, a user interface world. I mean, again, we certainly, we, we can, you know, make reference to JavaFX. We could smile and nod and say, yes, Oracle, someday JavaFX will be big. But in the meantime, for those of us using Java in the real world, you're talking about doing it on a server. Why does anybody care about write once run anywhere on a server? And the short version is, if you were ever a C++ developer, and you were anybody that old writing code way back then? Yeah, you remember the, the complete array of optimization switches you had to throw during compilation? You had to decide, I was writing code, C++ code back in 1995, when the Pentium was you know, just emerging out onto the scene. And so you had to decide, at the time you were compiling the code, mind you, whether you were going to generate 386 instructions, 486 instructions, or 586 instructions. Do you, in fact, assume that there would be a numeric coprocessor on that target machine? You had to know a great deal about your deployment environment in order to get the best optimizations possible. The beautiful thing about the JVM is it gets to make those decisions at exactly the right moment, which is to say, at runtime, when it's running the code, it can literally look under its feet and say, oh, look, that's like four cores down there. So I can change the assembly language that's being generated as part of JIT compilation to take advantage of the fact that I've got four cores and I've got this particular generation of hardware and so on and so forth. Trying to decide that stuff all up front, all ahead of time, means that either I guess very conservatively and I don't get the best performance possible, or I guess very aggressively and end up certain machines not being able to run the code at all. But it's more than just about the assembly language. Quite frankly, the JVM is one of two mainstream managed environments, the other one really being the .NET world and the CLR and so forth. 
And a managed environment means that there is an entity there, in this case the Java virtual machine, who is taking care of a tremendous amount of stuff for us. We know this, we've been in the JVM for a long time, but it's hard to remember back to 1997 when Java was first getting started. There were a lot of people who looked at these managed environments with a high degree of skepticism. There was a huge backlash, even before Java got started, against the idea of using a language which was fundamentally interpreted. That was what C++ guys called stuff they didn't like. Okay, well, yeah, that small talk thing, that's interpreted. That's never going to perform. That's never going to actually be able to get close to the metal, et cetera, et cetera. And it's telling that 1997 Java really starts to begin to gather that momentum. By 2000, Java is the de facto choice for building enterprise applications. And during that interim three-year period or two-year period, what really made the difference here quite frankly, garbage collection. Because really, if you want to get right down to it, to a developer, love means never having to say delete. I mean, think about this for a second. How, how often have you really had to worry about releasing objects when you're writing Java code? How much more complex would your life be? I'll tell you, go play around with C++ for a while and try to remember point, pointer ownership semantics and whatnot. People did studies back then around how much time was spent worrying about garbage collection and came up with numbers like 50% of the developer's time was spent worried about, do I need to delete this object? If I let it go, will it be a leak? If I delete it, will it in fact be a double deletion and cause the entire program to crash? Blah, blah, blah. Today, we're starting to think about managed environment for other kinds of things, such as for managing threads. We're starting to see uh, more models, you know, the actor's model. We can see ACA starting to make great inroads into this space. We can see people thinking about how do I manage some of the concurrency, talking about lock-free programming and whatnot. These are all things that we just let the JVM worry about so that we don't have to, so we can try to focus on what we're trying to do. Now, if you're a developer, again, there's a lot of you that say, well, look, if I'm never going to program in it, why do I care? And let's you know, not make any mistake about it, I'm not suggesting that you should program in Java assembly language. Not suggesting that you should go find a Java assembler. There are several out there that do exist, by the way. And you, you do not try to adopt that for your next project. But you do need to understand what's happening under the hood. You need to understand what's happening to your code. You need to be able to at least read that code for a variety of different reasons. And the tool of choice, really, I mean, quite frankly, it's the only standard tool because it's the only one that Oracle ships as a part of the JDK, is Java P. I'm not entirely sure what the P is supposed to stand for there. Java P code, maybe it's, I've never been able to find anybody at Sun or Oracle to be able to explain what the P is supposed to be there. Java C, Java compiler, I get that. Java H, Java headers for doing JNI, I get that. Java P, eh. But it's present on every JDK, and so you have a tool that as long as you have access to the class file, and Java P will actually operate off of class path, so you don't actually pass it a file name, you give it just the name of the class, and it does the usual class loader delegation thing to find the appropriate class, which means that, by the way, and this was vastly more important up until a couple of years ago, you could actually go look at the compiled code for anything, including the stuff that Sun shipped. And in some cases, this was absolutely crucial to be able to debug certain scenarios. There was one point, and this is going back several years, where I was working at a company where we were using BEA WebLogic. Anybody remember those guys? Back when EJB was a big thing, right? And we were doing some interesting class loader stuff. We were actually trying to inject our own class loader to load code out of a different place rather than traditionally off of the file system. And after a week of uh, frustrated debugging, we finally realized that the WebLogic class loader had a bug in it. It wasn't delegating up the class loader chain the way it was supposed to, which meant that our class loader, who was the parent to the WebLogic loader, wasn't in fact getting the opportunity to load the code. And we fired an angry email off to BEA, and they said, oh, you're right, and then we never heard from them again. 
Thank you, BEA. But this would not have been possible if we could not have, in fact, taken the compiled code and brought it into a form that we could understand. That is to say, we Java peed it, and then we quite literally walked through it. There's also some Java decompilers that are available that will take the compiled bytecode and try to turn it back into Java code. But that's not going to work particularly well for stuff that was compiled with, say, Groovy, or Scala, or JRuby, or Clojure, because in many cases, these languages will compile to different bytecode patterns than what we see coming out of Java C. So at the end of the day, you really, really want to understand what bytecode looks like because you need to be able to see what's coming out of your compiler. And I'll give you three questions. These are a bit dated, but they're still important. How are inner classes implemented in the JDK? I mean, think about this for just a second. Remember, inner classes, JDK 1.1 introduced as a way to allow us to create code, particularly the anonymous inner class, to be able to pass this as an implementation of a listener interface, to be able to capture this event. Now, originally, this was all a part of Swing and SWT and all of that. So if somebody pushes a button, I want to be able to capture that event and reference code in the enclosing class. Now, the JVM has very strict rules about that. You are not allowed to touch the private parts of another class. As a matter of fact, in the C++ days, we used to talk about how the friend declaration would allow you to explicitly violate that in C++. So we used to say that a friend is someone who can touch your private parts. Did any wonder why C++ creeped a few people out? I mean, seriously, you make jokes like that and everyone's like, that's funny, but I don't want to laugh because I don't want to be one of those guys. Seriously, the JVM will not allow a class to reference to access a private field of another class. So how exactly? If they didn't modify the JVM, and I tell you for a fact, they did not modify the JVM between 1.0 and 1.1. If they did not modify it to allow this to happen, how does an inner class access the fields, the private fields of the enclosing outer class? In later days, when we got to JDK 1.4, we got the assert keyword. Now remember, one of the key advantages of assert from the C++ days was that assert essentially disappeared from your code if assertions were not turned on. In C++, we did this through the use of a macro. If, if debugging was turned on, the macro turned into a you know, verifying line that would potentially throw an exception if that assumption was not held valid. If debugging was turned off, the macro was just empty, no op, nothing. Java, of course, doesn't have a macro preprocessor. Java claims that asserts go away at runtime if assertions are not turned on. How do they do that? And then the big one was, of course, generics. When they came out in 1.5, how exactly did generics look, considering that Again, they didn't modify the JVM at all. There is no concept of a generic inside of the JVM. So what does that mean for when you say, I want a new list of string, parens, parens, what is that actually instantiating? What is that thing in actuality? When we get to Java 8, now we have other questions. How is the Lambda implemented, for example? And this is a common question that you have to ask with any language that implements lambdas or any other sort of anonymous function blocks of code. When my lambda references a variable in the enclosing scope, is that a by val copy or is that a by ref copy? Meaning the lambda is now tucked over here. If I modify the value that it captured, does the lambda see the modification or does it see the original? How are you going to answer this? You can write a lot of code. You could try to write all of the possible ways that this thing could happen and see if you can see what's happening from a Java layer. Or, quite frankly, you could compile the code and look at the bytecode and know without having to write 10, 20, 100, 200, 500 different unit tests trying to cover all the possible permutations. The other thing is, quite frankly, how many of you have gotten into debates with other developers as to whether or not you should use string concatenation or string builder. These were all the rage for a long time, yeah. 
Have any of you ever actually thought to look at the compiled code? Yeah. And it's actually quite amazing how quickly people will shut up when you show them what the compiled code actually looks like. Not always, though. I, I actually got into this discussion with somebody at a client once where he said, oh, you know, rah, 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 rah. I said, look, here's the compiled code. Here's what it looks like. He says, that's not the compiler we're using. What, what, what compiler are you using? This is the Sun compiler, it's just freshly downloaded. Smell that, fresh bites, right? What compiler are you using? And he said, well, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it's not that one. <laughs> I'm like, you're just never going to accept that I'm right, aren't you? He's like, no. I'm like, okay, never mind. This is why I'm the consultant and you're not. Across the top there, we have good old-fashioned hello. Across the bottom, we have what hello compiles into. As a matter of fact, let's actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to leave. Uh, there we go. Everybody agree that that's hello? Modulo a few carriage returns. Okay, cool. So, compile it just to be sure. So if I run Java P on it, initially what Java P will give me is it'll just say, look, these are the publicly declared methods that I see on this particular class. And it won't actually give you the output. It won't actually give you the methods and the implementations. It won't show you anything private or protected or package friendly. Now again, as always, there are a series of options that we can pass. And in particular, there are two that, are that I find most helpful. The, the first one is verbose. The verbose option is obviously, as its name implies, it fills up with a lot more text, but it provides a lot of uh, shortcuts, if you will. It does a bit of spelunking inside of the class file format for you so that you don't have to do quite as much lookup on your own. And then the other one I find useful is dash C to actually disassemble the code. Now the third one, if I'm going to go to a third one, it's going to be dash P to show me all of the private. Now in this particular case, hello has no private, but dash C, dash P, dash verbose, hello. Okay, And you can see that there's a lot more here than what we saw the first time. Okay, Now, notice something about this particular output, and I'll walk through some of this stuff in, in a little bit, but you can see first of all that there's hello there, and you'll notice that hello actually has two methods listed there, even though I only wrote one. This is because, as you learned, likely, somewhere in your Java education, that whenever you create a class, the Java compiler demands that there be at least one constructor on this class. And if you do not provide a constructor, it will synthesize a no-argument constructor for you. More importantly, what does that no argument constructor do? Well, you can see it right there, is essentially it invokes the javalang object constructor. In other words, it invokes its base class no argument constructor. Okay? This is why if you were ever doing anything with Spring or any of these other dependency injection containers and you wanted to have a constructor on that class, you needed to provide a no argument constructor because Spring was going to use Reflection to invoke the no argument constructor. And if you didn't have one, then Reflection wouldn't work. You couldn't instantiate the object to the end. Because this was just a fundamental assumption that everybody kind of ran around with back in the late 90s, that a Java class would always have a no argument constructor, the end. Now, you look at this. First of all, you notice that those are line numbers. It's nice to know that line numbers did not die with basic. These line numbers are, of course, relative to each method, and, as God intended, they start with zero. Because any language that starts with one is clearly heathen and must be killed. Right? Because we are, at heart, C programmers. And the reason why arrays start with zero is because in C, the actual index was the multiplication times the size of the array to figure out how to do the pointer math to get there, and we like it that way. Right? Hooah. Let me get a booyah for C programmers. 
That was the weakest booyah I have ever heard. Wow. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't want to be C programmers after all. Now, you notice there's a bunch of stuff in here. I'll come back to this in just a second. But fundamentally, as far as the JVM is concerned, there is no such thing as a jar file. The JVM has no concept of these Java archives and web archives and EJB archives and all these other files that we fling around. Those are purely units of deployment. The JVM, as far as it's concerned, the fundamental atom is the class. And the class is represented in memory by this class file format. Okay, I say in memory, what I really mean is off of any permanent storage that the JVM uses to load the code. Okay, because class loaders can pull the code out from anywhere. As a matter of fact, there are several class loaders in the world that will let you make up a class at runtime on the fly. And as a matter of fact, if you really wanted to get down to it, starting with JDK 1.3, you can do the same thing using the Java dynamic proxy. You're essentially creating a class on the fly. But when the stream of bytes is handed into the class loader, handed into the JVM to actually interpret, it has to be in this format that we call the class file. Okay? Now, the JVM itself, fundamentally, is a stack-based operating system, CPU, register, whatever you want to call it. There are no registers in the JVM. As a result, learning the JVM bytecode language is the simplest assembly language you will ever see in your life. There's no registers to have to deal with. There's no accumulator and stack pointer and any of that stuff. And as a matter of fact, technically all of this is abstract. Technically, you could implement the JVM however you wanted. You don't have to push and pull all of these things off of a stack. As a matter of fact, many of the JVMs in production, they will push the first couple of parameters where, where, where the code says to push it onto the stack, they'll actually push it up into registers as long as there are registers available to be had. Because putting into a register is much, much faster than pushing and pulling from the actual stack itself. Here, though, we're going to talk about this execution stack because that is the heart and soul of how the JVM works. The execution stack itself, by the way, is described by the JVM specification as being exactly 32 bits wide. This has been later remarked to be the biggest mistake the Sun JVM engineers have ever made. Because this means that anything that's larger than 32 bits, that is to say longs and doubles, have to be pushed onto the stack using two slots rather than one. And it sucks. Because technically what this means is the JVM only guarantees 32 bits of atomicity so that when you're pushing a double value onto the stack, there is the smallest window of opportunity, but it is still there, for the CPU to switch away mid-double push. Which is why we start getting into some of these concurrency discussions, and which is why people start telling you when you're working with longs and doubles, you really should synchronize so that you make sure you don't thread switch away, or at least you make sure that both halves of the long or the double are being pushed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that stems from the fact that the execution stack is 32 bits wide, okay? Now, the other thing is that the names that we see inside of the JVM are always fully qualified class names. Packages, as far as the JVM is concerned, do not exist. Packages are simply a prefix to the class name, and as a matter of fact, the class name is the complete fully qualified name. You could, if you really wanted to, you could write Java code without ever using an import, and that would be very similar to what the JVM actually sees. So again, if we go back and look at some of this, here you see invoke special number one, I'll explain what that means in a second, method java slash lang slash object dot bracket init bracket. Okay. The JVM always thinks in fully qualified terms, and it prefers that slash-like notation to the dot-like notation. Now, why the difference? I've never been able to get a Sun engineer to tell me. I suspect they just wanted them to be different so that when they were looking at Java code versus JVM code, they'd be able to tell the difference as to what they were looking at, something that the JVM was executing versus something that actually made up parts of the JVM. Okay. The other thing you'll notice is that some of these declarations have, you can see here in the second, in the main block, 
towards the bottom, you can see this parens L, java slash lang slash string, semicolon, close parens V. This is a method descriptor. This is basically saying that the println method takes an array of Java strings and returns nothing. The parens indicate method parameters, and there is an encoding scheme as well there. If it's a non-primitive type, it's always prefixed with an L, and in this case, Java lang string semicolon, and V is for void. And if it's an array of, actually it'll be prefixed by a bracket, you can uh, actually, let's see, you can actually see that in the static void main, the line below it, the descriptor, parens, bracket, l, java, slash, lang, slash, string. That's an array of strings. And if it were a two-dimensional array of strings, it would be bracket, bracket, l, java, slash, lang, slash, string, semicolon. The semicolon, by the way, is necessary because that terminates the name of the class that this is an array of feels really complicated when I s describe it this way, but after you've looked at some of this stuff, it starts to become second nature. There is an encoding scheme for the different primitive types. I've got that in here. You can see I, you know, I, J, V. I refers to, uh, let's see, I refers to int, J refers to long, because L is used for the long class name. V is void, uh, B is byte. Most of the time all I care about are ints, longs, and then the occasional floating point. You'll also notice dollar signs will show up in a lot of these class names. You'll see that, in fact, when you start writing some code with inner classes or if you start playing around with Scala and looking at the generated code. The dollar sign is a uh, character that is frequently used for synthesized classes and method names because, at least for a while, I don't think it's true anymore, but for a long time, the dollar sign was not allowed in Java, but it was allowed at the JVM level. So the idea was that they were using the dollar sign to minimize the chances that you would pick a class name and they would pick a class name and clash with one another. Okay? Java, I think, later relaxed that restriction, but I haven't tried in a long time. The format of the class file, there it is in all its glory. Makes total sense, doesn't it? It's actually a really ingenious data, uh, data format. The first four bytes, and you know, my little uh, notation down here, U1 is an unsigned 8-bit, U2 is unsigned 16, and U4 is unsigned 32. The first four bytes of every Java class, anybody know what the magic number is? Cafe Babe. C-A-F-E-B-A-B-E. -E. It's ad actually rather frightening how few Java developers actually know that. Many years ago, I was teaching for a company that did in-class instruction, and we printed shirts that said, I love Cafe Babe, and gave them out at Java One, and everybody thought we were advertising some new product. Dude, what's Cafe Babe? Is that like a code generator or a debugger? No, dude, it's Java. No, seriously, what is this? What, do you, what is this like a new open source project? Dude, it's the first four bytes of every Java class file. No, seriously? Yes. The next two, though, minor version and major version. These are the versions that correspond to the version that this uh, version of the JDK that this was compiled for. If you've ever taken Java 5 code and tried to run it on JDK 1.4 and gotten an error, those two are to blame. Now, interestingly enough, these are not major version 1 and minor version 4 for 1.4 or major version 8 and minor version 0 for Java 8. As a matter of fact, Java 1.2, the major version was 48 and the minor version was zero. I have no idea where 48 came from, but it's been, increment, it's been incremented each time ever since. 1.3 was 49, 1.4 was 50, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After that, though, things get really kind of interesting. The constant pool, one of the things the JVM did as a measure of optimization is everywhere that a constant appears in your code, they actually lift it out of the code and store it into what they call the constant pool. Now the idea here is that if you have a constant in your code, chances are it'll show up more than once. So if we store it only once and then just have references to the constant pool, awesome, we only had to refer to that once. More importantly, they do this for every single constant that appears anywhere in your code. So the fact that you are using a print stream 
means that you're using java.io.printStream, which means that's a constant, even though it's not a constant that you used, it's still a constant, so they lift that out and put that into the constant pool as well. This is why when you look at Java P, the first parts of it in that verbose descriptor, it's dumping the constant pool at you. And you'll notice that there are a lot of different kinds of constants that show up here. For example, constant number one is a method reference, because calling a particular method, that method name is in fact a constant. As a matter of fact, the method name and the method class are both constants, which is why it's a method ref number six dot number 15. Number six is the class, and if we look at that, sure enough, class number 22, because the class name is also a constant. And in this case, it's a UTF string constant. So if we go to number 22, we see down here below, UTF-8 Java slash Lang slash object. See, how hard was that? It, it gets frustrating sometimes trying to untangle all of the different constant pool references. This is part of what Java P is doing for you. When it shows us the code down below, you'll notice that it actually threads back all these constant pool references for us. So here when it says invoke special number one, the comment over on the right there is specifically untangling the constant pool for you so that you can simply see Java Lang object constructor. And down below here, invoke virtual number four, Java IO print stream, println. And sure enough, LDC, which means load constant, says go grab the constant number three. Well, that's a string ref that happens to ultimately point to the string, hello Java bytecode, okay? Now again, the JVM likes these things in the constant pool because it can drop these constants in various places and refer to them much more quickly rather than trying to constantly go back to the in-memory data structure that you know, they store all of this class in once it, get, once it gets past class loading. They could put this in a, in a closer place. They could cache it, if you will. From the bytecode perspective, what ends up happening, particularly if you're using Java P, you tend not to look at the number references there, but your eye just slides off to the right to read the comment. But it's important to know how the constant pool works because if you ever need to figure out why it's pointing to something or if you ever really just want to see how the constants uh, work themselves out, you can follow it number one, as we did before. Number one takes, takes you to the class method ref, which takes you to the class and then takes you to the method. Here you see a name and type, number seven, number eight. The name is the init. This is, by the way, the special syntax they use to represent a constructor, because constructors technically have no name. And the syntax, the type for the constructor is it takes no parameters, notice the empty parens, and it returns void, notice the v. See, it's easy. It actually is once you get used to it. I mean, like most things, you kind of have to just spend some time swimming in it but it becomes much easier to read the more often you do it. It'll also help to understand what all of these different instructions are, which we'll get to next. Specifically, there are several different kinds of instructions within the JVM uh, bytecode set. And again, if you've ever spent, your, spent some time with any other uh, assembly language, these are not unusual, these are not unexpected. So for example, there are some stack manipulation instructions. Uh, dupe, dupe two, take the top element of the stack and then duplicate it. So in other words, it pops off the element, duplicates it, and then pushes it twice. This is frequently, you, you see this very often come up when, for example, you're getting ready to make a method call. We want to duplicate the return results from another method call, so dupe it so that we can hand it off to this other method to be consumed. Um, pop pretty straightforward, and then there are a bunch of instructions that will allow you to push a constant value onto the stack. One of the things the JVM instruction set has done is they have created instructions that are specific to each of the primitive types. So for example, a const null means push a null constant onto the stack, okay? The bi push here means I want to push a byte, a signed byte, onto the stack as opposed to SI push, which means push a two byte assigned value onto the stack. D const is for doubles, F is for floating point, I is for integers, L is for longs, and then LDC specifically is for loading a 
object reference constant. We saw that earlier when it was loading the string reference. Okay. Local load. One of the things that we, I mentioned that we have this execution stack. Technically, there are two other places that we think about. Specifically, there are local variables. Now, officially, the JVM re re reserves space in the method stack for local variables, but we don't see that showing up specifically here in the bytecode set. So when I say a load, meaning I want to go grab a value, what I'm doing is I want to grab something off the stack and load it into the local variable space, or I want to load the local variable and push it onto the stack, for example, as part of a method call. So local variables are stored over here in this other space, and then the execution stack. Nothing happens unless it's on the execution stack. So if I put something into a local variable and never put it on the execution stack, great. I, load, I assigned that variable once and never used it again throughout the body of the method. And again, there's, an, uh, there's a load instruction for each of the data types, and there's a store instruction for each of the data types. Branching and control flow really wouldn't be much of a programming language if the JVM didn't allow us to do things like that. And one of the great injustices that has per been perpetuated upon Java programmers from the beginning, Java does in fact have a go-to. It's actually kind of funny because for years, people you know, advocating Java over languages like C++ back in the late 90s, one of the great advantages was that Java has no go-to. Well, Java the language doesn't, but the JVM most certainly does. And in fact, compiled Java code makes use of GoTo on a semi-regular basis, usually as part of some of this other branching and control flow. Okay? So for example, if we see a deeply nested, uh, you know, if, 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 else, if, elf, else, else, if, if, else, etc., a lot of times that will in turn turn into code that will in fact do some go-tos, particularly if, it, if the compiler can see that these in fact might share the same branch of code. Where we often see it, quite frankly, is more in exception handling. When you do a try-catch block and you have several different catch blocks, remember you have to execute the try and assuming nothing goes wrong, you have to bypass all of those catch blocks. JVM drops a go-to right there to get to the end of all of that. Return, again, there's a return for each different primitive type plus return by itself for void. And then there's also a lookup switch opcode, which is specifically supposed to be a switch case implementation optimization. For a long time, the Java compiler kind, kind of stayed away from it because there were a lot of cases where lookup switch didn't work very well. And today, there are a lot of cases where the Java compiler just takes a switch and turns it into a series of if-else particularly if you want to switch on strings, for example. Of course, the JVM also understands the fact that this is an object-oriented language. There is an object model that it needs to understand. And so the new opcode specifically creates a new object. Now, the interesting thing about the JVM, we in the Java world, we understand that newing an object means implicitly you always call its constructor. The JVM does not believe that. As a matter of fact, the JVM very specifically requires that newing the object and calling its constructor are two separate operations. That's why when you, you see the new instruction, you don't actually see it passing the parameters right there as part of that instruction. That actually comes as a separate step to invoke that object's constructor. We'll see the opcodes for doing that in a second. There are some other interesting instructions here. Get field, put field, get static, put static. That pretty much does what you would expect. Go grab this particular field out of the, the object at the top of the stack. Go grab the static field out of the class at the top of the stack. And take that returned value and push it to the top of the stack. Check cast instance of. That's pretty much what you would expect. Anytime you do a cast, it will do a check cast to determine whether or not this thing is in fact of that particular type. And the difference between check cast and instance of is that check cast will throw an exception and instance of will simply return true or false. Invoke virtual, invoke static, invoke special, and invoke interface. These are four different ways that we can invoke a method. 
And as a matter of fact, there was a fifth one that was introduced as a part of JDK 1.7, Invoke Dynamic, which I know Venkit's going to be covering later, so I won't go into that. But essentially, these are the four different ways that methods can be invoked within the JVM. And the two that are going to be, you're going to see most often will be invoke virtual and invoke special. Invoke virtual invokes a method the way we're accustomed. In, invoke this method on the most derived method type available on that object. Meaning if I call toString, go to the toString implementation that's furthest down the hierarchy for whatever this particular object is. If this is a person, go invoke person's toString. If this is in fact a student which descends from person, even though it's held through a person reference, go invoke the student toString. Standard, dynamic, dispatch, all of the things you learned when we talked about virtual dispatch in Java. Invoke special, on the other hand, says, screw all that dynamic dispatch stuff. I want you specifically to invoke that method of that class on that object, regardless of what the virtual table tells you to do. Why do we need invoke special? Well, you can see it's already being used uh, right there in the constructor, because I specifically want to go to my base classes constructor. Anytime you use super to invoke a base class method, you are implicitly doing an invoke special. Because if super turned around and invoked the most derived version of, yeah, you just end up in an infinite loop, okay? So invoke special shows up a tremendous amount in this bytecode. There's a bunch of conversion operators, convert doubles to floats, doubles to integers, doubles to longs, floats to doubles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's a bunch of mathematical operations here as well. We've got your usual raft of the algebraic operations, add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo, right? In other words, divide but capture the remainder, et cetera. And we need those for all of the different data types. Because again, I can't really add an int and a double. Implicitly, I have to widen the int to be a double and then we can do double arithmetic. So I need to have an integer addition opcode as well as a double addition opcode. We also have bitwise operations to rotate bits around and all that stuff because back in the day, 1994, 93, 92, when the JVM was first being built, that was considered necessary. Quite honestly, I can't remember the last time I've written any remotely production Java code that used any of the bitwise operations. And if for whatever reason, a future version of the JVM sort of dropped those, I really don't know how many of us would notice, to be very, very honest with you. We've got some comparison operations to be able to compare a, couple of compare a couple of operands and push the results greater than, less than, equal onto the top of the stack. And then exception handling. This one gets, this one gets a little weird. So let me, do, let me do this. I'm gonna actually, we're gonna go in here and we're going to do this. Try. And let's see, catch, null pointer exception and PE, system.out.println, stupido. And let's do this, catch, exception, Yeah, you laugh, but I know you have that somewhere in your code base. <laughs> you laugh. Matter of fact, whenever I'm doing a code review, whenever I see that, I say, oh, well, then you don't mind if I do this. Right? Because if this should never happen, then this will never be executed, and it will never take down, for example, the web server in which your web application is running. It's actually quite amazing how quickly people back away from this statement when that code shows up right after it. Okay. I am missing a curly bracket here. That's kind of weird. What's that? Why is it an exception? I don't understand your question, sir. I'm not logging the exception? You're right. 
You're absolutely right. I will log it. As a matter of fact, I will now spend 10 minutes um, just putting logging somewhere into this code just so I can log that exception in case it happens in this demo <laughs> of Hello World. Because I'm going to have a system administrator check the logs after the demo's done. Okay. So let's look at the generated bytecode here. Specifically what happens when the JVM does exception handling. What it generates is an actually a table that's sort of adjunct and next to the method itself. So what we see here, and I, I warned you there were going to be go-tos, what we see here, first of all, is we uh, you know, get static system.out because we need to get a hold of the out va variable that's on the system class so that we can use that in order to invoke printlin. And then you see printlin there, and then you see go to 32. Okay? So specifically what's happening here is I am going through that code, and assuming nothing goes wrong, then I will just do an arbitrary branch down to line 32 in the method, which you can see as a return. That's the happy path. That means I went through the try block with absolutely nothing going on. Now, if an exception got thrown, if for whatever reason out is null, because the world has ended and system.out got set to null somehow, then what will happen is the JVM sees this exception table down here. And notice specifically that it's a basically a four-part tuple. There's three values of interest, first of all, from and to. This says that between line 0 and line 8, if an exception occurs, and it's of this type over here to the right, then your target, in other words, where the JVM needs to go in order to handle this exception, is line 11. So if there's a null pointer exception, we go to line 11, and in this particular case, you can see we store something, we get the static, well again, we get out, we load the constant string stupido, we invoke virtual println, which implicitly consumes that value on the stack. So stupido goes, it's on the stack, when println executes, it's gonna pull its parameter off the top of the execution stack. So stupido will no longer be there when we come back. And then after that's finished, let's see, we invoke virtual println, so when that's finished, we go to 32. And at that point, we're done with the method, the method returns, we're done. Similarly, if some other kind of exception gets thrown between lines 0 and 8, then the target is line 23, same basic story. So exception handling doesn't actually show up in the bytecode per se. We don't see a try bytecode followed by a catch bytecode, et cetera. What we see is this exception table down here. Now the other table, which is kind of interesting that the JVM tracks is this line number table, okay? The line number table specifically, the reason for it is so that you guys can get your nicely printed stack traces. This is actually a feature that was introduced in a late drop of the JVM, and by late I mean like Java 5, Java 6, I don't remember exactly when, because originally Java was able to sort of guess how this bytecode mapped back to the original source. They held it in an internal structure. But as alternative languages for the JVM became more popular, suddenly the JVM wasn't able to just sort of infer those line numbers. And the other languages needed to know how to produce them in such a way that they would map back. So for example, when Scala C compiles some code, we wanted the JVM to be able to print a nicely formatted stack trace that would say, yeah, this error came from line 57 in your Scala code. And the main reason that we got this feature is because of Groovy. Because when Groovy code was executing, there was a whole bunch of Groovy stuff that was happening per line of Groovy code. And as a result, stack traces in Groovy were like gouging your eyes out. Because you would have a four-line Groovy program, and if something went wrong, it would be a 50-line stack trace. 
because Groovy, literally Groovy had no way of being able to represent what the stack trace was, and so the JVM did what it was supposed to do, which was look at the full executing stack trace, which meant you saw a whole bunch of Groovy innards that you never wanted to see, okay? So the line number table actually turns out to be kind of important. Similarly, there are some hints to the JVM around, for example, how big the stack will be, how many local variables there are, how many arguments there are to this method. This is so that when the JVM is allocating memory, it can decide exactly how big it should be ahead of time. And so it's assumed that whoever compiled this code actually did some kind of account to figure out what the deepest this execution stack could ever be. It counted the number of local variables. It counted the number of arguments to this particular method. It did all that ahead of time so the JVM could trust and therefore allocate efficiently. Now, it used to be, and I haven't tried in a long time, it used to be that if you actually hand assembled some code and you removed some of these hints, the JVM would, would fall back to some default values. Today, I don't know if it'll actually execute that code or not used to be that default was like it assumed a stack size of like 16 and it assumed eight local variables and eight method parameters and so on and so forth. There are, by the way, I should have mentioned this, there are some intrinsic limitations to the class file format. You see how the constant pool, you see how it's u1 tag, u1 info, you see above it u2 constant pool count and u2 is in fact an unsigned 16-bit value. That means that the maximum number of constants that can appear in a Java class file is 2 to the 16th, right? 65,000 something. The maximum number of fields that you can have in a given class is 65,000 something. The maximum number of methods you can have in a class is 65,000 something. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have a class with 65,000 methods in it, you need help, okay? But as we start talking about all of these alternative languages, and particularly as we start talking about various tools that will doctor up your code, many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, it was very popular to talk about these ORM tools, JDO and those guys, who would actually come through and annotate. They would change the code after it was compiled to add some additional fields, for example. Some of your code coverage tools will actually add some additional fields to be able to mark when each of these different methods has been hit and which parts of these methods will be hit and so on and so on. And so you combine all of these tools and suddenly that practical limit becomes a little bit smaller, in some cases a lot smaller. It's not impossible for you to hit these limits long before you hit 65,000, particularly the constant pool. That's usually the first limit you'll run into if you're going to actually run out of anything. And again, this class file format is defined by the Java Virtual Machine specification. If Oracle were to ever try to change this, it would be a, it would be a big deal. It would be potentially a breaking change to the JVM. So these are limits that we have lived with now for 20 years and we will have to live with for the remainder of Java's practical lifetime. All right, so question, how are inner classes implemented? We'll actually walk through this one because we got a couple of minutes here, like one minute here. Let's go back to, and specifically I'm gonna, uh, let's see, we'll call this hello, and I'm just gonna create private string value equals howdy y'all. Okay, and then I'm going to create public class uh, inner public void do something. Again, this is just the sort of canonical poster child case. I have an inner class value is, or actually, because remember for inner classes, the enclosing class is always considered in scope to the inner class, so this should always pick up the hello.value over here. Then over here, we'll do this. We'll say hello h equals new hello, like so. And then if I want to create an inner 
hello.inner equals h.new inner. What's that? Oh, you're right. It needs to be fully qualified, like so. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying, yes. See, pair programming works. Although this is more like gang programming. Okay. I think I got all that right. Let's find out. If it compiles, ship it. Don't. Is it H? I've got h.new. No, that might work. There we go. Okay, the h.new, by the way, is necessary because remember, an inner class instance has to be associated with an outer class instance. This is one of the weird edges of the Java language spec. So h.new means that h is now going to be considered the outer this for inner. Remember discussions of outer this back when you first learned about inner classes? Now, this all compiled, and if I run it, sure enough, it works. And if we look at the compiled classes, we can see that there's a hello class and there's a hello dollar sign inner class. So how exactly did Java manage to do inner classes? Well, we can follow it pretty clearly by looking at hello here, and specifically we'll look at hello main, and we can see newing up hello, there's the invo invocation of the constructor. Again, the dupe here is necessary because whenever you call a method, you're gonna consume that which was pushed onto the execution stack. So we need to take the reference hello that we just created and we dupe it. So now there's two copies of that. The first one's gonna be used as part of the constructor invocation, okay? Then we're going to new up a hello inner, dupe it. We're going to uh, load. Back here, we stored the hello instance to the local variable array. We're going to load the local variable back out, dupe it again. Here we call get class. We do init. Let's see what else. Down here below, we invoke virtual do something. Okay, this seems pretty straightforward. So let's look at hello inner. And in fact, I want to look at the compiled bytecode. So there's hello inner. So you notice it takes hello as an instance. We store that off. We put that into this field called this dollar sign zero. That's our outer this. And again, you know that the compiler synthesized it because of the dollar sign right there in the middle of it. And if we go to do something here, we find something fairly interesting. First of all, you see the use of the string builder, okay? When you're doing string concatenation, automatically you're using String Builder. So stop using String Builder directly. It's just annoying and verbose and confusing. Just go ahead and say string plus string. But then notice down below, check this out. We reach for field and then we invoke static method hello dot access dollar sign zero zero zero. What the hell is that? Well, Sure enough, if I look at all of the private methods of hello, you can see that they generated a static method called access dollar sign zero zero zero, where you pass in a hello. And if we look at that value, sure enough, it reaches out, grabs that field value, and returns it. In other words, Every time you use an inner class, you have intrinsically opened up a hole to allow anybody to access those private fields. Yay encapsulation. Now, normally we don't care, right? Number one, because this is package access. Number two, because if you tried, again, for a long time, if you tried, at the dollar sign was not considered a legitimate Java identifying character, so you couldn't call this from Java unless you used reflection or you used Groovy or you use cl uh, Clojure or you use Scala or you use anything that's not Java. Okay? Now, just out of curiosity, how many new how many of you knew this bit of trivia before you saw it? Okay. 
That means that for years, however long you've been a Java programmer, you've been writing code that has allowed these back doors without realizing it. And that's why you want to be able to understand and read Java bytecode. Bye.